Hey y'all. I am at Mary Jo's and I'm going to try to make this video. Um, it's not what I'm used to the setup. Oh, by the way, there's my nail color. I do love it. It's close to Pompeii purple by Opie, which is my favorite. Anyway, if the phone falls, I'm in the house and it fell off of the bowl that I have turned upside down to raise um, the level of the phone so you're not looking up my nostrils. And I hope this is okay. You know, when I wake up in the morning, you guys, I my mind is always racing um, with ideas of what to make a video on. Now, the one I make after this one is, it probably will be today. Um, it'll be done of the outside of my van. Now, one of the things that I want to cover today is, I was concerned that I might go over the extra income supplement income that you can make while you are on Social Security. Now, I'm going to tell you what my research turned up on an IRS website. Not some website that's trying to advertise or sell you something, okay? Um, so when I looked it up, what it says is, you can make up to, which includes your Social Security, okay, up to $25,000 a year without paying taxes on it. Now, I know I'm going to get you people that are freaking out. And you're going to say, oh, blah, blah, blah. Well, you go ahead and express your opinion, but I did research this, okay? Because I wanted to make sure that everything I do and what I receive, I am handling in the correct, lawful, ethical manner, okay? So, I make approximately, it's under 13,500 a year, okay? So that means that I can make up to about $10,000 without having to worry. Um, I just wanted you guys to know that, that, that I am concerned if I get gifts and for some reason they're so generous that I'm worried about having to pay taxes. That's why I checked it out. <clears throat> Now, unless Donald Trump or Hillary donate to my channel, there's no chance that I'm going to meet that $10,000 threshold, okay? So, just so y'all know that I am trying to be wise, I am trying to be ethical, and I am trying to obey the laws, okay? So, that's that. I'm going to try and keep my eye on the time here. You'll notice me going cross-eyed like this. Um, I'm going to talk about my little brother today. He was two years younger than me. Um, we were very, very close. This video may go over a little bit, y'all. We were very, very close as children. As a matter of fact, when I was seven and he was five, my mother went to work in the afternoon about three o'clock. And my dad, my stepdad, who will be called dad from here on out because he adopted me when I was about four years old. So he gets all the credit for being my dad. Anyway, when I was seven and my parents, uh, the leaving at three o'clock and the arriving home about six, that left about three hours that I was alone and responsible for my little brother. Now, I was very responsible when I was a kid, y'all. I grew up fast. I grew up alongside of a lot of little kids that I babysat for, changed diapers, fed them, that whole thing. So I was around little kids from the get-go. 
I know there will be you guys who trash my parents for allowing that, but they knew that I was responsible enough to handle it. We did not touch the stove. We didn't touch the heater. We never put a knife in the toaster <laughs> or stick anything in the light sockets. Plus we had neighbors. We lived in a very small apartment community. My dad was stationed at Loring Air Force Base in Caribou, Maine, and that's where my parents met. He was my mom's third husband and last husband. So anyway, um, my stepdad got transferred to Texas pretty soon after my parents got married. And so we lived there until I was about eight, I think. And then we moved to North Little Rock, which is where Jacksonville Air Force Base is. And that's where my stepdad retired from. But anyway, from a very young age, we went to Maine for a year when I was 13 and he was 11. My dad went to Vietnam and he did two tours over there. So my mom thought it was a good idea for us to move there and be around her side of the family. So um, we lived with my grandmother who had a little apartment on top of a very tiny little store. And one day he came upstairs and he told my mom that he saw John Paul get a candy bar and put it in his pocket and walk out with it. My mother was heartbroken. And of course, uh, he had to go downstairs immediately and apologize and pay for the candy bar. And he was grounded. That was the beginning of my little brother's problems. Now, we moved back to Arkansas and there weren't any things that I know of until he was about 13. He started sneaking out of his bedroom window after everybody went to sleep and rode his bicycle down the dirt road to meet up with an older chick that he had sex with. Yeah. The way my um, dad discovered he was doing this is because he left the screen off his bedroom window. So that's how he got caught. He started doing drugs, smoking pot, huffing tolio. If y'all don't know what that is, it's where you saturate a washcloth in turpentine, paint, gasoline and you put it in a baggie and you hold it over your mouth like this and you breathe in deeply horrible you guys horrible one time my dad and i had been gone somewhere together and we drove up in the yard and my little brother had his face He had taken the gas cap off of my mom's car and he was breathing in the gasoline fumes. Um, of course, he got a good whipping for that and yelled at and told him how terrible that was for him to do that. He was going to affect his mind. I thought that that was so hypocritical. My parents were functional alcoholics. They drank after work at night during the week and on the weekends, they got drunk. How can you tell your children not to do something when you're doing the same thing? Now, he couldn't buy beer, okay? So he did what he could to get high. Um, he started getting in serious trouble. 
He couldn't keep a job. My mother kept getting him jobs because she knew a lot of people. She managed a liquor store. Not a great place for an alcoholic to work. Uh, he couldn't keep a job. He started doing harder drugs, running around with a rough crowd. He quit high school. Um, until finally, he went to jail. He did stupid stuff, y'all. Him and the little group of people that he ran around with, guys. One time, I was living in a little single wide trailer next to Kim's drive-in, hamburger place. They broke into Kim's and left their leftover ketchup, mustard, Hamburger patties that they didn't eat. Yeah, they went in there, broke in, and cooked, you guys, in the wee hours of the morning. And they threw all their leftover shit in my trash can. So the cops came. Uh, they took me to the police station in Searcy. Now, they knew that that I did not know that. They knew me, they were local policemen. They knew that I was a teetotaler, never did any drugs, had a small baby. They knew that I would not do anything like that. But because the evidence was in my trash can, they took me. When I got to the police station, um, they said, Deborah Joy, we know that you did not do this. We suspect your little brother and some of his friends did this and dumped the leftovers in your trash. So if you agree to show up in court, if you need to, then we're gonna take you home. And so they did, they took me right back home. And of course they did discover who did it. My little brother went to jail and his buddies. That was the first time he went to jail. He kept doing things, y'all, until he ended up in prison. He was in Texas, and he tried to rob a drugstore, and he went to prison. Now, all the times that my little brother went to jail, uh, before he went to prison, my mother would bail him out. I remember they took out a second mortgage on their home to get him out. That did not help him, y'all. And my dad was against it, but he had to go along with my mother or she would have harangued him until he was in the nut house. I decided that I would never help my children get out of jail. And I told them at a very young age, if you do anything to go to jail, call me, let me know where you are so I don't worry about you, but do not think that I am going to get you out, forget it. If you do something to get there, you're gonna stay there and you're gonna take your punishment. And I meant that sincerely. I believe in tough love. All that getting your kids out of trouble all the time, that does not help them, y'all. Anyway, he came home from Texas and came to live with me and my second husband. It was right before Christmas, a couple of weeks. He had no clothes. His shoes were torn up. So we got him clothes and shoes. And he was doing pretty good. He said, sister, I'm done with this life. I have learned my lesson. From now on out, I'm going to be on the straight and narrow. And I tell you guys, I was never so glad to hear anything in my life. So for the few weeks that he was there with us, he was home with us all the time. He did see one or two of his old friends, but he even said, I know they're not good for me. But Christmas Eve, the ringleader of this group of guys that he hung out with 
came by and wanted him to go for a drive. This is really getting long, y'all, but I have to tell it to you since I started it. So I said, John Paul, are you sure that you should be hanging out with Norman? You know he is trouble. He goes, sister, I know, but we're just going to go for a drive. And I said, I can't stop you. But you remember, we are all going to sisters tomorrow to cook and have Christmas dinner together. He said, okay, I'll try not to be out too late. The last time that I saw John Paul, he was jumping off my front porch, waving to me as he got into the car with Norman and they drove off. He didn't come home that night, which wasn't unusual. So my husband and I and my um, baby, my first son, went out to sister's and there was a bunch of us out there and so you know we were cooking and the men were watching football and all this kind of stuff and there's a knock on her door and i'm thinking finally john paul's showing up and i opened my door it was my ex-sister-in-law well she wasn't my ex-sister-in-law she was my sister-in-law at the time she was married to my husband's twin brother and she was standing there crying and there was a policeman behind her. And she said, Deborah Joy, John Paul was killed last night and they found him in the river. So he was 21 and he died Christmas Eve. I don't, I don't want y'all to, you know, get all upset and get, you know, it happened a very long time ago, a very long time ago. But that's what drugs can get you into, being murdered. Now, y'all, we knew who did it. His friend Norman told the police that John Paul was driving and he was doing drugs and he drove off the bridge into the river. It broke John Paul's neck and Norman got out. A couple of his buddies came to me a couple of months later after it happened and said, Deborah Joy, this is what happened. And if you say that we told you, the same thing will happen to us. Norman had murdered this little old gentleman that checked the back doors down Main Street at night. He was a slow gentleman. He rode a bicycle with great big steer horns on the front of it. But the city gave him that little job to help him have some responsibility and a little bit of money. They were going to break into a local drugstore. And the little guy drove up on his bicycle and caught them. And Norman killed him. The reason that he murdered my little brother is because he was afraid because John Paul was going straight that he would narc on him. So he had to take him out. He told his little group that he gave John Paul drugs and then broke his neck, put him behind the wheel and pushed the car off into the river. I don't know if my parents could have helped him by not getting him out of trouble. I don't know that. But you guys, there's nothing wrong with tough love. And I've had to practice that with my younger son. And that's a whole other story, which I won't talk about unless I get his permission. 
but you guys don't coddle your children. Don't get them out of every little scrape they get into because they are going to learn. It doesn't matter if I do this because mom and daddy are going to get me out. No, don't do that. You've got to have tough love if you truly love your children. I love you guys, and I'm sorry this video was so long. I just have to talk about what's on my heart. And he came to me many times this week, and I thought about him. So that's why I'm making this video. But y'all don't feel sorry for me. Everybody has tragedy in their life. This is just one of my tragedies. And mainly I wanted to talk to y'all about it because if you're getting your kid out of every scrape they get into, really y'all, that's not love, that's guilt. Don't do it. I love you guys and thank you so much for watching and commenting and understanding that I cannot always answer comments. Sometimes if I skip a day, like this morning, I have over 2,000 comments, y'all. I can't possibly answer them all. I would love to. But y'all do something fun today. Hazel and I are going to go check our mailbox. That's always fun. Thank you, guys. And um, I don't know what else we're going to get into today. We stayed inside. Oh, this shirt, it's a new shirt. I got it for $2 at the thrift store. But it's going to be redonated because it has to be ironed. Yuck. Bye, y'all.